Brother Worshipful Brother Keith Dayton. Very Worshipful. Very Worshipful Brother Keith Dayton. Sorry. That's okay. Was the Grand Director of Music of the Grand Lodge of British Columbia and Yukon. Past Master of Blue Mountain Lodge No. 182. Past District Education Officer from District 28. And a past thrice pursuant. Pursuant. Sorry, let's go. Uh, Grand Lodge, a uh, lot of perfection of the Valley of Fraser Valley, Scottish Rite. Uh, I, we had the pleasure of meeting Brother Dayton at uh, the Masonic Restoration Foundation Conference a year ago. Brother Jerry and I were there, Brother Doug was there, and he gave this lecture, which we thought, wow, it's such an intriguing, captivating lecture that we need to have, we need to bring him down to Southern California, so we could and to share his information. And with that, he also assisted us being the, edit the guest editor of the Fraternal Review magazine, uh, The Flower of Life issue. And today we'll have this issue, uh, we have extra issues for $5 upstairs. We'll accept cash or check or credit card, whatever you have, and Brother Dane will sign it for you, personalize it. But he definitely contributed to pretty much the entire magazine, pretty much piggybacking off this lecture that you're going to see here today. So if you're interested, after dinner, please walk up to the table and we'll be happy to assist you with a copy of the magazine. So without further ado, Brother Dean. Thank you, Brother Well, good evening, everybody. Um, I just got to want to see a quick show of hands. Who has seen or studied the Flower of Life? So what else has it been found? It's also been found. 
found in a forbidden city in Beijing. This is actually a Chinese dragon or Fu God. It looks strong and really menacing, but let's have a look at what's under its paw. It again, is a pattern of the flow of life. Is he guarding some sacred knowledge, perhaps? It has also been found at the Temple of Osiris in Abydos in, in, in Egypt. This is the oldest representation that we can find of the flower of life. It's 6,000 years old and it's found on several colors. It's also found in Israel, in ancient synagogues in the Galilee. The rosette pattern on the right hand side is actually a first century BC mosaic in Israel and is also seen in Kirkwall, in Scotland, <coughs> on a Knights nice Templar tombstone. So I believe the complete ancient flower of life is actually an interdimensional tool, a portal if you like, a stargate, a window to what some people call the inner space planes. Now before I lose you, let's see how it's formed and more importantly, what it follows. Now, I'm going to ask if we can we bring the lights down? Is it possible to bring the lights down a bit? <coughs> It'll help with the whole not be a situation. Okay. So now, I would like to show you how physical reality can mani manifest itself out of the void. So buckle up. Here we go. I want you to imagine that it's complete nothingness in the universe. Let's just dwell on this for a moment. Nothing exists, no gravity, no stars, no planets, no atoms, no particles, no quantum mechanics, no God particle. In the beginning, the earth was without form and void. And darkness was upon the face of the deep. We are in that darkness. Spirit gave rise to consciousness. I was so pleased to see the eye of Horus at the entry to your, to your temple here. It's wonderful. Consciousness itself could not move up or down. It had no context of left, right, up or down gravity. It had no sense of anything other than itself. No context for mobility. So consciousness expanded itself to a perfect sphere around its middle. This is the first circle, actually a sphere, in the flower of life. This is the first experiential gnosis. Now as I'm sure you're all aware, gnosis just signifies knowledge or insight into humanity's real nature as divine. That in itself leads to the deliverance of the divine spark. Here we are seeing this divine spark coming into existence. Ever wonder where we get the term sphere of influence? This is exactly where it comes from. And the Spirit of God moved upon the face of the water. This divine spark had a beautifully divine idea and design consideration to actually stay within that sphere from its consciousness perspective and move his consciousness to the extreme part of the sphere and replicate itself. So it moves to its current awareness. 
You can replicate this yourself with a single compass. In this quote from the Bible, you can easily imply that the beginnings of creation are happening right at this spot. Where he prepared heavens, I was there. For he set the compass on the face of the dead. In this case, I is wisdom. It's the wisdom to create. We all have the wisdom to create. We all have the wisdom to manifest. We don't always tap into it, but we do have that wisdom. So he replicated himself completely. And God said, let there be light. Is this resonating with any Masons in the room? No? Good. So God created the heaven and earth. And out of this creation has come one of the most sacred shapes and containers for mostly all sacred geometry, known as the Vesica Piscis, or Vesica Pisces, depending on your pronunciation. This translates from Latin as fish bladder. Within the Vesca Piscus, there is an incredible amount of knowledge about width, proportions, depth, square roots of 2, 3, and 5, which are irrational numbers that go on forever. We'll explain just where they come from in a second. As well as the most important Masonic unraveling that I will explain later. In the same way as human beings begin as a single cell and replicate from there, the Vesica Piscus is used in lots of religious art. Used almost exclusively today to denote membership in the Christian religion, you, you've probably all seen this symbol, the last one is up. It was a custom of early Christians to communicate hidden recognition by drawing this representation in the dust, and it was carried over from the practice of ancient Pythagoreans, who discovered the shape's unique properties and made it more important, an important part of their teachings. However, in earlier times, this ancient glyph was actually associated with the goddess Venus. And from a pagan perspective, was actually represented, and I'm sorry if I offend anybody here, but it was also represented by the female genitalia. Remind me at the end of this presentation to talk about other feminine um, revelation, which we can uh, go into. Let's move on. So I want you to think of all of these movements or creation of spheres can be seen as representing another day. So in day one, the Vesica Piscus is created. In day two, the tripod of life is created again. Consciousness moves to the next point in the sphere, creates itself again. So let's just reorientate the shape. When we reorientate this, we actually get the Holy Trinity, which we see in lots of religious doctrine. Day three, day four. So in many Bibles in the world, not just Christian, on the fourth day of Genesis, exactly one half of creation was completed. Day five. And day six, the seed of life or the Genesis pattern is created. According to some researchers, the seed of life is a symbol depicting the six days of creation in which God created life itself. Of course, on, this, on the Sunday, or on the seventh day, he went out, out in his Harley Davidson and had, had a blast. That's what I would do anyway. So here's an, an interesting excerpt from the 18th degree of Scottish Rite. I normally ask if anybody can finish this now, but I'm not, I'm not going to tonight. It's now my duty to inform you that the seven circles around which you have travelled represent the six periods in the world's history and the beginning of the new era.
Now normally, in my own lodge, I have two or three people who can finish this, I'm going to finish it for you. When time shall be swallowed up in eternity, which is the seventh circle, of which the seventh circle is a symbol. This is the culmination of Rose Croix Freemasonry, and it's called the candidate being admitted into the living circle. So this is the flower of life. But to better visualize it, let's look at it as spheres. This is actually known as the egg of life. And we can actually map the flower of life as, uh, to human creation itself. So here the whole story of the flower of life actually mimics the creation process of humanity. So here's an interesting sketch. On the left is an embryonic cell with an hour of conception, and on the right are the Da Vinci sketches of the seed of life from around 1510, way before microscopes, about 300 years before the mammalian, mammalian ovum was discovered. Every living thing on earth starts out in a formation like this. So here's a shady view of the egg of life, which is actually easier to see than the, the, the bland spheres. What's interesting is when you join up the centers of this sphere, you get a cube. So this is the easiest shape to see within a flower of life. And it's important that everybody can visualize this part of it, so the rest of this presentation can actually make sense. So back to the progression. <clears throat> this pattern can easily and clearly go on forever. But in every, every culture, it seems to stop after 19 circles. Why? Well, I believe our ancient brethren would have revealed one of the ancient secrets of sacred and hidden knowledge. And at that time, they couldn't allow it to become in the knowledge. This is an extension of the flower of life. When we extend the flower of life, we can actually form one of the most sacred forms in existence, which is actually known as the, the fruit of life, which contains 13 circles or spheres. This itself is actually said to be the blueprint for the universe. It's the basis for the design of every atom, every molecular structure, every life form and everything in existence. It also contains the geometric basis for the delineation of a very special shape. Okay, so if you draw a line from the center of every sphere to the center of every other sphere, you get a very special shape. Does anybody know what it's called? No takers? Anybody know what this shape is called? It's actually called Metatron's Cube. So Metatron's Cube actually brings forth all of the Platonic solids. And Archangel Metatron is actually considered in esoteric literature to be the voice of God. One, or if not, the highest Archangel, and is depicted in ancient text with the image of this cube that bears his name emblazoned on his chest or floating around him. Why should Masons care about Metatron? Why should we care about Metatron? Well, Metatron is identified as the angel that led the people from Israel through the wilderness 
after their exodus from Egypt with the pillars of lightning and smoke. Metatron's cube itself is also a holy glyph that's uh, used to ward off evil spirits. So Metatron's cube creates the platonic solids. So let's have a discussion about what the platonic solids are. Platonic solids have all faces are the same size, all the edges are the same length, they only have one angle within its entire shape. And all points touch the edge of a sphere perfectly. So the platonic solids are actually five structures that are crucial because they are the building blocks for organic life. These five structures are found in minerals, Animated and organic life forms, they're found in sound, music, language, etc. I was just, uh, I just found out this, this little piece, um, actually someone pointed out to me last time I was given this lecture. What's the most sacred number we have in Masonry? Three. Good. And when we give grand honours, um, what number of grand honours do we give to the most senior person in the craft? 33. Nine. So nine is a very sacred number because it contains the most sacred number of three, three times. I want you to have a look at the actual um, angles at the bottom of this. If you have a look at all the angles, when you add up these numbers numerically, you get one number. Nine. Seven and two is nine. One four four is nine. Two one six zero is nine. Three six zero zero is nine. The last one's a little bit more difficult to see, but you can see it. Six four and eight is eighteen. One and eight is nine. So do Masons care about platonic solids? Yes, they should. So let's go through the creation of these um, uh, platonic solids. So Metatron's cube creates the four-sided tetrahedron. I've tried to put these in three-dimensional pictures so that they're actually much easier to visualize. And I really do want you to remember of all of the shapes that you're going to see in this one because there's an extension of this shape which was of particular interest to Masons and all man mankind, humankind, sorry. It also creates the he hexahedron, which we saw earlier on. It also creates the uh, eight-sided octahedron and the 20-sided icosahedron. And finally, the 12-sided dodecahedron. Each of the previous shapes were actually associated with the classic system of the four elements of fire, air, water, and earth. According to Plato, this particular shape was known as aether, and it was also known as quintessence. Quintessence is a material that fills the region of the universe above the terrestrial sphere. Plato mentions that there is a most translucent kind of matter which is called by the name of ether. It was thought to make up all the heavenly bodies and it was noted by Plato that there was very little presence of quintessence within the terrestrial sphere. So the five platonic solids are geometrical forms and are said to act as a template from which all life springs. They are the building blocks of organic life. These five structures are found in minerals and everywhere. The Greeks taught that these five solids were the core patterns of the physical creation of life itself. The four solids were seen as the archetypal patterns behind the four elements of fire, earth, air, and water. 
Well, the, hell, the first was hell to be the pattern behind life force itself. In Plato's school, you were not allowed to discuss Aether. It was a forbidden subject. If you were found discussing and debating Aether, you were rejected from the school. It was considered so sacred that you couldn't talk about it. In uh, the 1980s, Professor Robert Moon at the University of Chicago demonstrated the entire periodical table, and literally everything in the physical world is actually based on these five forms. So physics, chemistry, biology, sacred geometrical patterns are all being rediscovered. Let's go back to the Vesca Piscus. And I probably will pro promise you there's less pornography this time. But let's look at another revealing of sacred geometry from the shape. If we assume that the radius of each of the spheres that are touching uh, have a dimension of unity, or one, if we intersect some lines, we get some really interesting numbers, which include the square root of three, the square root of 2, and finally, the square root of 5. Now, watch carefully. If you take the rudimentary geometry from the Vesca Piscus, and one of the elements being the square root of 5, and you do a simple add of 1 and divide by 2, you get an interesting equation. Does anybody know what this is? Does solving the equation help? The golden ratio. Golden ratio, yes, thank you. This is known as the golden ratio or phi. So let's talk about phi. You may have all heard of the Fibonacci sequence. that has been in all sorts of books and all sorts of YouTube videos, etc. It's a representation of phi. So it's Taking one and adding it to itself and getting two and then taking one and two and getting three, three and five, eight, eight and five, thirteen, etc. And known as the Fibonacci sequence. So if you actually take the last two digits there of 610 and 317, divide them into one another, you get 1.61803, da, da, da. So the higher you go up in the Fibonacci sequence, the closer you get to that sacred number of 1 plus root square root of 5 divided by 2. Another way to represent this is actually in this chart. So this is actually the Fibonacci sequence. And what's interesting here is you have a male perspective to this and you have a female perspective. The male perspective, they go and add logically 1, 1, 2, 3, 5, 8. They'll go around and take the square. They will take the square. We take the square in the lodge domain. Women, however, will actually go on the curve. A different path, but they end up in the same place. So the golden ratio is just found everywhere in, in, in the world, from human dimensions to pleasing art. You all have a look at your finger. Point your finger like this. Normally this, the distance for, for this part of your finger is about an inch, and the long part is actually 1.618 inches. Now, if you have a, a longer piece, you'll find that your uh, part of your hand will actually be longer as well. So, let's look at some other examples of, uh, of phi. And it goes from the very small to the very huge. For example, the snail shell or nautilus shell. You can see I'm fine, I've actually been enacted there, all the way up to spiral galaxies. Now I want to introduce you to my daughter. This is Natalie. She's also a fan of the flower of life, so much so that she actually has a tattoo of the seed of life on her back. Bless her. So let's look at some of the um, dimensions identified here. 
So these dimensions and sizes actually come from the sizing in PowerPoint. I actually put the, these lines in, measured the lines between them. Um, these were the actual dimensions that PowerPoint said they were. So here you can see it, albeit rudimentary, how human form is based on this ratio. You've all probably heard of the Vitruvian Man. That was all built with 1.618, etc., 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 and taken into account. Now, if Nat had pointed her fingers, we might have got a more accurate um, description. But I got this picture two days ago, so. <laughs> but thank you, Nat, if you ever get to see this. But you get the idea. So, other examples are within human and non human faces. DNA molecules themselves are not immune to the Fibonacci sequence. The DNA, BDNA, has two grooves called the minor and the major groove, which are in proportion of 13 to 21 angstroms, which are two numbers in sequence in the Fibonacci sequence. The molecules themselves measure 34 angstroms long by 21 angstroms wide, again, two numbers in the Fibonacci sequence. And that's for each full cycle of this double helix spiral. What I found is if you look hard enough, you can find the Fibonacci sequence everywhere. Okay, let's go to the other. So what other shapes are in the flower of life? What's this one? The tree of life, yes. Here we have the Kabbalistic tree of life. And uh, also we have the chakras. I want to point out, right in the middle, the heart chakra. So please keep in mind that shape for, uh, for later on. It'll come, in, uh, it'll come in handy in the later part of this presentation. So from a body perspective, um, this is where the chakras, chakras lie. So the music, music of the spheres. Has anybody heard about 432 hertz? Show of hands. One, two, two or three. Okay. If we take eight hertz as our starting point and work up to upwards by five octaves, we reach a frequency of 256 hertz. And whose scale, the note A, has a frequency of 432 hertz? This frequency, which is the top end of the theta range, or brain waves, and the star of the alpha range, makes us feel very relaxed. Verdi and many other musicians, like Mozart, tuned their music to this frequency because it was more natural. However, the American Federation of Music changed it all in 1917 and changed the A, A as we know it, to 430 amps. Then in 19, uh, sorry, London followed suit in 1953 and it was approved as a general uh, tuning standard for musical pitch there. So all the music that we actually listen to today is actually in dissonance and has no scientific relationship to the physical laws that govern our universe. Isn't that scary? We should all go and listen to music that's 432 hours. Tons of it on YouTube if you want to learn and have a look at it. And this is probably the subject of another presentation I can say. So, just one more shape. Is this one of the hidden secrets in Freemasonry? This shape has been known by many names, including the Chariot of Fire, Chariot of the Gods, a wheel within a wheel, described in the Old Testament of Ezekiel. This is said to be a, to be a divine light vehicle used by ascended masters to connect with higher realms. The symmetric form is called the stella octangular or 
the star tetrahedron. Or you could look at it as a three-dimensional star of David. But it also has another name. It's known as Merkabah. So I um, spent a weekend doing a retreat where I did a Merkabah meditation. It was a guided meditation. And um, the, actual med the, the actual word Merkabah means a uh, light spirit body. It's seen as an interdimensional vehicle. The guided meditation that you went on was a breathing exercise and it was a 17 breath meditation. The first set, six will focus on your, polar your uh, polarity. The next seven actually help you with proper pranic flow, so pranic breathing. Pranic breathing was supposedly how we, we um, breathe from your in Atlantis. And uh, further breaths actually activate and shift the consciousness. You actually get this Merkava spinning. You actually, it allows you to connect your energies with higher energies and spiritual beings in higher dimensions. So, you are imagining as you're going through the breathing exercise that you have this Merkava around you. You do the breath, you start the Merkava, and you have two Merkavas around you, actually three, there's one that's stationary. But you have one that spins clockwise and one that spins anti-clockwise. One is male and one is female. And they spin at a Fibonacci ratio of 34 to 21. So, I found, I did this, this exercise for probably about two or three months and I had the weirdest dreams ever. It was fantastic. But again, I don't know, I, I could go and visit my dad in Scotland at the time, I could go and do all sorts of stuff. I was, where I wanted to be, it was like zap, it was an out-body experience, it was a wonderful experience and well worth looking into if you've got the time. Here's a representation of the Vitruvian man with, uh, with actually uh, the, the star tetra region. Now we're actually looking at this at an angle. The middle of it is in fact at his uh, heart, heart uh, uh, chakra. So does anybody see any similar similarities to anything else? Any similarities? No, I'm sure you. What about this? Hmm. So, finally, I want to summarize by explaining why the flower of life is so central for Masons. Let's go back to the um, to the Vespasian. If we extend the lines out to begin the next sphere and add a dissecting line through the Vesper Piscus. We then take a line from the top of the second sphere and draw it to the bottom of the second. Do the same on the other side. And then take a line from the middle of the second sphere to the bottom of the second sphere and do the same on the other side. We happen to get a little right angle there. Does anybody know what that is? Can anybody see what that is? People always ask what, what angles should the square and compasses be at. Well, just draw a couple of circles and you can work out for yourselves. If you don't actually see what it is, let me help you. Just remove the spheres for a second. But what's more fascinating than anything else is we add that sphere back in again and we put light consciousness that started the whole thing to begin with, back in the center of the sphere, the image becomes even more compelling. Thank you so much for your attention to me.